in New Britain, Connecticut, just behind a strip mall, lay a secret garden. It was a patch of green, covered by trees and shrubs. In 2007, a hunter was trying to locate a good place to stalk his prey. When he arrives at this garden, but he doesn't find flowers and a nice bench to sit on. Instead, he finds something that has been unearthed. It was human remains, and this location was turned into a mass grave by Connecticut's most prolific serial killer, William Devon Howell. And this garden is where he would dump the bodies of his victims after he had taken them for a ride in his so-called Murdermobile. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then please drop it a like and leave me a comment below, letting me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel, and don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. When police are informed of the bodies, they quickly find this garden is actually a mass grave containing the mutilated remains of three women. They were 53-year-old Diane Kuzak, 24-year-old Joyvelin Martinez, and the third body belonged to 40-year-old mother, Mary Jane Menard. Mary was last seen getting into a blue van, but this is as far as the police got. These were all local women who had disappeared in a six month period, a few years prior. By the time of these grisly discoveries, the assailant was already in prison, serving a 15 year sentence for the killing of Nilsa Arismendi. Nilsa had disappeared in 2003, like the other women, but there was something different this time. This time, there was a witness. Police said that all the women in some way were connected to Howell through substances, and Nilsa was no different. But her boyfriend witnessed her get into a dark blue van and was able to inform the police of her disappearance. On the 25th of July, 2003, he said that Nilsa got into the van with a man they knew as Devin in a car park along Berlin Turnpike to get substances. Officers located the van and it was registered to a woman called Dorothy Holtham. And according to Dorothy's parents, the van had recently been sold to her boyfriend, William Devin Howell, who had Devin tattooed on his arm. After forensics had analyzed the van, they found the back seat was stained in blood, soaking through the fabric into the foam underneath and attempts had been made to remove evidence, as other seats had recently been replaced. Although the blood was found to belong to Nilsa and another unidentified person, without her body, prosecutors didn't have enough evidence to prove she had been murdered, and Howell agreed to the lesser charge of manslaughter before the body could be recovered. But this was before police had found those other bodies. A book was written by Anne K. Howard in where she speaks directly with Howell. I strongly recommend you check this out. He goes on to tell Anne that Nilsa just wanted a ride to Hartford, which she agreed to do, but instead he forced himself on her through the night and the next day before killing her and dumping her body in his so-called garden. The other three murders would never have been linked to Howell if not for him confessing to his cellmate, who was called Jonathan Mills, who himself was a triple murderer. He told officers about Howell's alter ego, the sick Ripper, and his twisted fantasies that he carried out. He talks of how Howell picked up women in what he called his murder mobile. He thought of it as his personal torture chamber on wheels. Howell told his cellmate there was a monster inside of him that just came out. Mills was able to draw a map of where a further four bodies were buried in the garden based on what Howell had told him. And in April of 2015, 
Investigators found the bodies of Arismendi and three other victims. Melanie Ruth Camellini, 29, Marilyn Gonzalez, 26, and Danny Lee Wisnant, 44. They were found in the same wooded area, behind the shopping mall, which Howell referred to as his garden. Howell's first victim, Melanie Ruth Camellini, had been forced upon, strangled and hit in the head with a hammer. In Anne K. Howard's book, Howell said, I grabbed her by the throat. I raised a hammer and told her, if you give me what I want, I won't hurt you. Sadly, this was not true, and things only got even darker. Mills told investigators that Howell kept the body wrapped up in his van, sleeping next to it for two weeks while calling her his baby because it was too cold to bury her outside. Howell refutes this in the book, His Garden, saying that he only slept beside the body because he had no choice and said he never called the corpse his baby, but had confided in Mills that he had slept beside the body. Howell cut off the tips of Camellini's fingers and dismantled the bottom portion of her jaw before throwing the body parts in a rubbish bin behind a shop in Hartford. This was in an effort to hide her identity. He disposed of the rest of the body in what would become his graveyard. In what was to become a new ritual for him and his victims, he said, I go through a Mickey D's drive through with a half naked, tied up expletive in the back and told them if they made a sound, it would be their last. None of them did. Howell talks about how he did this with his next victim. He kidnapped Gonzalez and forced himself on the 26 year old throughout the night before stopping at a McDonald's to get her what would be her final meal. Howell made a strong point that his motivations were never about the actual act of killing. I just killed them to conceal the evidence. I knew that once I had my way with them, they would go to the cops and I'd end up back in jail, so I had to keep that from happening. I definitely didn't enjoy killing them, as I choked them out. I was thinking, just hurry up and die. He admitted to forcing himself on all of his victims, except Wisnant, who he said he killed in a fit of rage after realising the 44 year old was transgender. How do they know I did just free? The bodies were nothing but bones when they dug them up. I did them all except Danny. After all the bodies had been analysed, officers found DNA of six of the seven victims inside Howell's so-called murder mobile. Officers now had their man, and Howell was charged with a further six murders in 2017. Surprisingly though, Howell decides to confess to the murders. He says to spare the victims' families the pain of going through a trial. He said, first, I want to apologize to the victims' families. I know everyone wants to know why I committed these crimes. I don't have an answer. I do not know myself. He cried in court when recounting the murders during a sentencing hearing. Is this potentially a way of trying to manipulate people by gaining sympathy? Or did he really have empathy for the families? Howell claimed to have wanted the lethal injection, and that's what he thought would happen with the confession. But capital punishment was abolished by the state, and Howell was sentenced to 360 years. Something I find hard to believe is Howell's childhood. I am yet to find a serial killer that has not suffered some trauma in their life leading them on a path. I am a believer that these people are like a perfect storm, but Howell claims to have had a good childhood. He said he came from a good family home, but as he got older, he had twisted fantasies about forcing himself on women, and he became very angry. He said, one night, I don't know, something just made me say, well, tonight's the night I'm gonna cross the line. 
I'm going to do it. I'm going to make my fantasy come true. The murders were something I chose to do because I'm selfish. It's not like there was some beast driving me that I couldn't control. I decided to act on my impulses. Howell was known for the brutal and savage nature of his crimes, but he claimed that he was not a monster. He said, I mean, I committed some monstrous and heinous crimes, but my true character isn't a monstrous and heinous person. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. As I mentioned earlier, I strongly recommend you read the book, His Garden by Anne K. Howard. Inside, it shows the conversations with Howell that we have only touched upon. That's all we got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane.